Where is the dwelling place of God? My sister and I used to argue about that growing up. Actually, more specifically, we'd argue about the placement of the baby Jesus in our manger scene. See, she always thought that he needed to be right here, right next to Mary and Joseph, where they could gaze lovingly on their newborn baby. But I thought, look at all these people who have come so far to see him. He really needs to be out here more center stage so that everybody gets their fair viewing options. My sister and I thought about a lot of other things too. There was one time when we shared a room. That was not a very good idea. We fought about toys and space and cleaning up. And I remember the day that she walked into our room and presented a long piece of red tape. She push pinned one side of it to one wall and then carried it across the very center of our room and push pinned the other side to the other wall. And she said, this is our boundary line. You get half, I get half. Your stuff stays on your side, my stuff stays on mine. You don't come on my side, I don't come on yours. And I said, okay, this was all right with me. And you know, it really did bring peace for about mm, two whole days. Maybe it was more like two whole hours. I'm not sure because very shortly after, my mom walked in and said, girls, you need to have your room clean by the time you go to bed. And suddenly, my sister decides, you know, I don't think I actually need 50% of the room. She so benevolently told me that I have more stuff and probably need more space, so she's perfectly happy just moving our boundary line over so that she only gets 25% and I can have the rest of the room. Wasn't that so kind? I was not fooled for a second, which created conflict, and then she decided to just take the tape down altogether, which also created conflict. And this thing that we had put up that we thought was going to bring peace actually did quite the opposite. You know, two Sundays ago in the first Sunday of Advent, Jason showed us a video by the Bible Project about peace. And I just want to refresh our memory with just a quick clip of it. So check this out. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. I love that video's definition of peace, definition of shalom as something complex with many pieces that comes together to form a whole, that comes together in completeness. So often we ascribe peace to calmness or to being quiet. We think that the avoidance of conflict is peace. We build our boundaries or our fences or our red tape in order to separate groups so that we avoid conflict and we call that peace. But that's not the definition of shalom. I think the early Jewish Christians struggled with this too because for as long as they could remember, they had cornered the market on God. If you were to ask them, where is the dwelling place of God? Certainly they would say, well, it's with the Jews. The Jews are the people of God. They have the law of God. They've been in covenant relationship with God for as long as they can remember. And even as Jesus started coming on the scene and created some of these divisions because some people started following his way, our early Jewish Christians would still tell us that the dwelling place of God is with the Jews because after all, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came to proclaim the message of salvation to the Jews. So when Gentiles started hearing this gospel and kind of wanted what Jesus had to offer, the Jews were kind of having a hard time with it. They were trying to figure out, wait, what does this mean? We never thought this was really even a possibility. And the question at hand was, do the Gentiles have to go through the Jews in order to access, in order to access Jesus? Do the Gentiles have to go through Judaism, have to become Jewish, in order to receive the salvation of Jesus. Now, ultimately the matter was settled. Paul met with Peter and John and James and they decided that no Gentiles did not have to go through Judaism in order to accept Christ. But these divisions didn't automatically go away and they were clearly still at the forefront of Paul's mind as he, sit, as he sits down to write this letter to the Ephesians, the Gentile believers at Ephesus. 
And at this point in time, the divisions were still kind of so great that the Gentiles were the outcasts. They were the oddballs. They were the ones that the others were kind of, you know, side-eyeing. That the real believers, the veteran believers, weren't really sure even belonged. They weren't really sure this was still a real thing. So Paul wants to remind them of who they are. He starts by, you know, kind of de describing the divisions between the two of them, making it clear that these divisions are of human hands made in the flesh. It's a physical trait done by human hands. But then he reminds them of who they were before Christ. He says they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and without hope and without God in this world. But then he says, you who were far off have been, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And what a wonderful thing that is for us because we as Gentiles are some of the first beneficiaries of that more inclusive gospel. And then he tells them what Christ did in his reconciling work on the cross, destroying the dividing wall, breaking down the hostility, making the two groups one, abolishing the law. And then he tells them why. And this is what he says in verse 15. He did this so that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. See, the reconciling work of Jesus on the cross, what Jesus did, did not just bring peace between God and humanity, but it brought peace among humanity by creating a new humanity. And Jesus didn't just do this by absorbing one group into the other or by making one group the most important and telling everybody else to look like them. In fact, Jesus broke down all the divisions that they were upholding against one another. Those divisions that Paul told us were of the flesh, were a physical thing. I even think this is why Paul tells us that Jesus abolished the law because he's saying that those divisions that they held, that was a human thing, not a holy thing. So this is why Paul can say that Christ himself is our peace because he created a new humanity. He created a new identity, one that is neither Jew nor Gentile, an identity that supersedes both Jew and Gentile. Because remember, that definition of shalom is when complex things like humanity and various pieces like humanity come together to form something that is whole, come together to be complete. The gospel of Jesus Christ is incomplete without the Jews. The gospel of Jesus Christ is incomplete without the Gentiles. The gospel of Jesus Christ is incomplete when these two groups or any groups uphold their divisions and their hostility and stake their own claim to God instead of being united in one new humanity. So the reconciling work of Christ on the cross wasn't just between humans and God, but it was also to bring peace among us, to reconcile us to each other. And I think that actually might be the harder part because when I think about the divisions that we have, even just among Christians, even just in the United States, even just in our own little Midwestern part of the world, we are divided along political party lines, we're divided along racial lines. We're divided along, along economic lines. We are divided denominationally and theologically within those denominations. And these aren't just benign aspects of our identity. Much like the Jews and the Gentiles, there is hostility associated with these differences. Let's pause right here for a second because I want to be clear that being united in Christ does not mean that our differences go away. It doesn't mean that we suddenly all start looking the same or acting the same. And it definitely doesn't mean that we just avoid them and pretend they're not there. There's great diversity within the body of Christ. And that is a beautiful thing. Unity as part of Christ's new humanity is not the same thing as uniformity. When I visited a church in Kenya, there was dancing in the aisles during the worship service. When I visited a church in Cuba, there was no dancing during the service, but when it was over, they moved the pews out of the way and they taught us how to salsa. At my Baptist church growing up, we weren't even allowed to clap to the beat. Culturally, physically, traditionally, there is great diversity amidst the body of Christ. And being unified doesn't mean that all those things go away. But it means that they don't bring hostility, that they don't have to bring division or separation. 
what we normally do is we put up our boundary lines to separate it so as to avoid conflict and we call that peace, but that is not true peace. That is not shalom. This is where we have to remember that when Christ came to make peace, when Christ became our peace, he didn't just absorb one group into the other. He didn't just give us all what we needed to look like. This is why I think the early Jewish Christians struggled so much because like I said, they wondered if the Gentiles had to go through them, had to go through Judaism in order to access Christ. But I think if Paul were writing this letter today, we would be the equivalent of the early Jewish Christians. We are the ones that now think that we've cornered the market on God. Because if you ask us, where is the dwelling place of God? We would say with Christianity as we know it, certainly. We are the ones who are now the gatekeepers. We are the ones who now decide who's in and out. And in fact, the church in our country has a really bad reputation of drawing those dividing lines of you look like us, you act like us, or we're not quite sure if you're in. We're the ones who are kind of side-eyeing these other people going, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm not sure the kingdom of God is accessible to you. Or if it is, you have to come through us. You need to look like us and think like us and come be a part of us and act like us in order to access that salvation. And that is not the peace of Christ. When Aaron and I were youth ministers at one of our at one of our past churches, we had a group of teenagers who dressed really differently. None of it was necessarily inappropriate, but it was very flamboyant. The hair, the makeup, the clothes, it just really stuck out among our youth group and among our church and people started talking, but they were coming. They were coming and they were hearing and they were learning about Jesus. And one day a fellow staff member pulled us aside and said, you need to tell them that they can dress however they want to on their own time, but when they're at church, they need to look like the rest of us. And I remember thinking, doesn't Jesus say the opposite? So what boundaries or fences are we still putting up today? What barriers or red tape do we still have in place? Maybe even in the name of peace, but it's actually just doing the opposite. The divisions that we're upholding don't actually bring the peace of Christ. They may bring calm or quiet. They may avoid conflict because we're so separate that we never see each other and never even have the chance for conflict. But this is not the peace of Christ. This is not shalom. You know, these verses tell us that there are some things that Jesus' work on the cross definitively did. He broke down the dividing wall. He put an end to the hostility. He abolished the law. He made the two groups one. Jesus did these things. But I would argue that the rest, creating a new humanity, being reconciled to God and to each other, that's at least partly up to us. Jesus made this new humanity and now we have to live into it, recognizing it as our first and foremost identity. Jesus made us into one new humanity, united us in this way. And now we have to accept that other people, even if they look or act or think differently than we are, they are also a part of this new humanity. Jesus broke down barriers and we need to be breaking them down whenever we discover them, either in our own individual lives or when we discover them corporately as the church. Because like Paul says, listen to what he says here at the very end. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. So where is the dwelling place of God? It is among us as we live into our new identity as the new humanity in Christ. Where is the dwelling place of God? It is among us as we continue to break down barriers and fences and boundaries and red tape and anything else that divides us in the name of a fake peace. Where is the dwelling place of God? It is among us as we realize that we are incomplete, not at peace, without the oddballs and the outcasts and those people that we're not totally sure really belong in the kingdom. But here's a hint, they really do. Where is the dwelling place of God? 
It is with us because the word became flesh and dwelt among us and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us or among us because Christ himself is our peace who reconciled us to God and reconciled us to each other in perfect, complete wholeness. Where is the dwelling place of God? It's right where Christmas tells us it is. With us. Among us. In the peace between us all. <laughs>